According to Jonathan Green, the incomparable scholar of the language which fell off the back of a lorry, slang is the poetry of the gutter. It's the poetry of the disenfranchised, the poetry of the have-nots. Poetry is also, as Hausmann noted, the straightest way to starvation. Not much future there, then. And not much future in the gutter, either. We're looking at an OG and an OD. It doesn't stop poets writing. Gore Vidal described irony as the weapon of the impotent, and so it is. Always has been, always will be. It doesn't change a thing. Peter Cook recalled how the doughty Weimar satirists prevented Hitler coming to power in 1933. They both might as well have been talking about slang, which is euphemized as unconventional usage, though, of course, it's not particularly unconventional. It's just kept out of the puritanical media, which ignores whatever trespasses beyond the limits of decency, whatever is outside its self-prescribed boundaries. Wall-to-wall -wall witlessness and unbelievably low IQ fodder for slow learners is OK. The language of the street isn't. We are not children. Satirical exercises may be as politically and socially impotent as Vidal reckoned, but is corrective change really the point of them? The real satisfaction is to be had in the creation of texts, of slang which will be deemed offensive, and of satire. Satire need not be funny, but it must be mordant, vicious, aggressive, and hurtful. Unless it's hurtful, it's no use. These, then, are the weapons that the weak possess. So what if they, we, use language which is reckoned bad? or unsuitable for polite society, whatever that is. The self-interested actions and irresponsible actions of the powerful are infinitely more damaging than words which are reckoned unseemly and unfit to be spoken or written in public. Further, the powerful targets of the voices from the gutter are frequently incapable of recognising that they are being held in contempt. They just don't get it. Because they speak a different language, a language which, as the late Geoffrey Hill observed, they hold in contempt. They don't value it. So they don't acknowledge its venom, its loathing, its barbs, which are hardly noticed. They are impervious. Politics is inseparable from the people who practice it. The feeble pleading that it is not personal but about issues is a cross-party lie. Politicians from the extreme left to the extreme right are more like each other than they are like normal human beings. Their shared language is proof of this sameness. They all spout the same clichés. Hard-working families. Hard-working people. I am seeing a few green shoots. Green shoots of recovery. The green shoots of economic spring are appearing once again. It is personal, which is why we should mock the member for Uxbridge and South Ryslip for being the rear end of Caligula's horse. Which is why we should mock the out-of-her-depth and massively compromised schoolmarm Mrs May ad feminam for having willingly submitted to the Trump lout's radical handholding, Which is why we should mock her husband for making a nation cringe with his proud admission that he carries out menial domestic tasks, which most men would do without noticing. I definitely do the, the taking the bins. I do the traditional boy jobs, by and large. Slang is the expression of what we think, rather than what we are enjoined to think what we are bullied into not thinking, what we are liable to censor ourselves for thinking. It describes the actual, rather than some sort of ideal, which we are enjoined to achieve by hypocritical politicians, 
sodomitical bishops and exploding imams. The bust. What I got arrested for in San Francisco. <laughs> San Francisco, I got arrested for... Uh, what do you think? We can hear that, Daddy. Um, I'm not going to repeat the word because I want to finish the gig here tonight. It's, uh, Lenny uh, Bruce was, as usual, on the money. There is no what should be, there is only what is. Get in the court to swear the heat in what he say, Your Honor, he said blah, blah, blah. The judge, he said blah, blah, blah. <laughs> then the guy really yented it up. That's right. <laughs> I didn't believe it. There was a guy up on the stage in front of women in a mixed audience saying blah, blah, blah. Slang is exhilaratingly contemptuous of those who attain power, those who attempt to impose their will on the rest of us. We are capable of thinking for ourselves. Slang deflates the preposterous notion of human perfection. It acknowledges what we are rather than what we should be. Uh, what we should be, that is, according to our supposed betters. Who are just now, depending on taste and religion, blessing Allah's suicide bombers, dating a choir boy, or getting pleasurably whipped by a lady in latex whom they will pretend not to have heard of when the slime of the gutter press comes to blackmailing. The more one sees of this end of humankind, the more one's milk of human kindness turns sour. Slang is the most sour poetry. It does not wish you well. It's demotic. It's the spoken and very occasionally written invention of the tap room, the bar room, the workplace, the barracks, the private place. The received idea about slang, that it's a form of language which occludes and excludes, is, I believe, wrong. Slang is about showing off, about increasing one's idiolect, about finding a better expression for blowjob than blowjob. It's about flexing one's lingo muscle. It's an expression of verbal dexterity. Imagination costs nothing. The pleasure of slang is in the making. It's a boast. My boast is that I added to the already brimming store of words for drunk with barded, i.e. legless, like the air race, and to the sexual lexicon with rubbing offal, which is pretty much what intercourse is. I'm absurdly proud of these coinages. Slang is centripetal. It gets to the core of what it describes, and whatever it describes is made vital. The gap between signified and signifier is narrowed, exaggerated. You fucking cunt! You fucking, fucking, fucking fucked up fuckwit. <laughs> Jargon, the prissy net curtains of language, prescribes instead, you sexual intercourse, and you fornicating pudendum, and you crass genitalia. Words, words. Is it the actions and objects themselves that the petty-minded get so enthusiastically worked up about? Or is it their verbal signifiers? The words attached to the beast with two backs is to accuse someone of being a have-sex or a make-love or possessing excrement features and a faecal head, what bodies like the dim-witted football authorities call foul and abusive. What sort of cunt decrees that cunt is unacceptable whilst vagina is OK? Jargon is everything that slang is not. Decentrifugal, evasive, drably euphemistic, unthreatening, conformist. The coinage of jargon words is not a creative act. Jargon does not attest to our capacity for linguistic invention. While slang belongs to the gutter, jargon belongs to the executive estate. It is the clumsy, graceless, inelegant, aesthetically bereft expression of houses with three garages, of business people who insistently refer to their workmates as colleagues, of drivers who think it important to distinguish a Mondeo from an Astra. It is delusional. It inflates pomposity, officiousness and self-importance 
rather than punctures them. Slang mocks. Jargon crawls on its belly, giving great forelock, hoping for promotion. Users of jargon often can't speak because they are stifled by having their head trapped in the jejunum of someone senior to them. And that person, for example, a high-flying multi-platform forward planification colleague, is also unable to speak due to the position of his tongue. In jargon world, this can prove a problem. Why ought we to respect scum of the earth like the Trump lout, who have attained power by grasping every opportunity for self-promotion? My air is blowing wildly in the wind. By backstabbing, by lying, by making themselves Croesus rich, by borrowing so much that the banks can't foreclose on them. Nice hotel. They do this in order to be able to boss their fellows. Rub a successful politician, and you'll find a busybody who refers to him or herself in the third person, always knows best, who yearns to display its prefectorial pettiness on a global stage. Rub the Trump lout, and you'll find that along with being the most mortgage man on earth, that's what leader, leader of the free world means, along with that debt of $750 million, his proudly proclaimed racism and misogyny. Why not? His cosmic ignorance, his chilling nationalism. We have to build a wall, folks. We have to build a wall. His blatant nepotism. It's a massive problem. His tax paying, his bullying, sheer nastiness, his complete lack of generosity. Have Trump. His success in turning America into a pariah state. He has launched on an undeserving world a leatherette-faced conciliere called Kellyanne, the New Jersey blueberry princess of 1983, who has, in turn, brought us a useful new turd of despicable jargon, alternative facts. Our press secretary gave alternative facts to that. Which means lies. Lord Acton was wrong. It is not power which corrupts, it's the other way round. Power is neutral. It can be exercised beneficently. But power is more often than not corrupted, abused by the people who are attracted to it. Power is attained by those who already harbour the germ of corruption, but who usually keep that germ hidden, even from themselves, behind a mask until they've attained the throne. That mask may be smooth or clownish or lovable or populist. Whatever it is, its wearers give themselves away with their abasement of language. They coarsely simplify complicated ideas in an access of patronization. I wanted a northern powerhouse, 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 northern powerhouse. Don't they realise how tired, how clapped out their paltry jargon is? It's the language of people who can't think for themselves and arrogantly believe that the rest of the populace shares their infirmity. We don't. We are all in this together. Education. Real change. Education. Real change. And education. <laughs> With the strong the stable. Strong and stable. Strong and stable. Strong and stable. Strong and stable. Coalition of chaos. These people are programmed morons. Their threadbare formulae are more than just pockmarks. They're seething buboes, signalling an absolute contempt for the populace whom they regard as gullible patsies to be patronisingly talked down to. They signal too a contempt for the language of the country they are meant to be governing. They signal their own poverty of thought. Are they brainwashed? They're certainly tongue-washed. Drip down, trickle down. 
jargon words, which, like so many jargon words, describe a non-existing process, a non-occurring phenomenon. Sure, in an ideal world it might exist, but not in this one. The hypocritical, knowingly dishonest theory and the illusory practice are worlds apart. It is part of the organised social lie. The Gospel according to Matthew got it right, and nothing has changed in the last two millennia. Jargon begins at the top, which is where putrescence and decay begin, fish rotting from the head down and so forth. The trickle-down of wealth is illusory, a blatant lie. Rottenness stays at the top, just ask the bottom. However, the drip, drip, drip of septic jargon is undeniable. It is to be heard everywhere. The received idea about slang that it's a language which occludes and excludes is, I believe, wrong. That definition is, however, appropriate to jargon. Jargon has stealthily nicked slang's clothes from the washing line of usage. It is today jargon which occludes and excludes. I agreed with the fees office that a proportion of the maintenance and cleaning of my house, hence the housekeeper, should be on the parliamentary alert. A Scottish grandee remarked of the Douglas pig, if I had a moat that small, I'd have mucked it out myself. As well as pigs with tragic moat problems, we have further expenses poor MPs, countless wealth-sharing CEOs, business gurus, altruistic bankers, white-collar paragons, philanthropists, lovers of mankind. But which bit of mankind? Patrons of what are called the arts, high IQ media innovators, humble barristers, internet billionaires who rob the rich to give to the poor. Is that right? And let us not forget the management consultants who have meekly inherited the earth. Blessed, blessed, blessed. Whilst this creme de la creme de la creme de la creme de la creme talks ceaselessly about transparency, its mores and practices are as densely opaque as the law will allow, or even denser. Jargon is the language of the trained liar of the professionally mendacious, of the dishonesty trainee who learns from its masters. It is the language employed to construct what the American journalist Ben Bradley called the non-denial denial. It is the language the French call la langue de bois. It is the language of the culpable who will always sidestep admission of guilt. It is the language of bad faith, of people without conscience who, if they ever suffered shame, have long forgotten what it felt like. What part of the brain is it that barristers have surgically excised in order that they can, without shame, without the faintest obloquy, defend the indefensible and prosecute the patently blameless? It is, presumably, that part of the brain which suppresses moral infirmity and transforms life and liberty into a game. Their parallel world is rendered yet more ludic, or ludicrous, by the anachronistic garb, the wigs, the ritual and the jargon, which is what Latin borrowings are. The Lord does not concern itself with trifles. A victim's body whereby, in proportion to the value, criminal act. The English translations of all these are unexceptionable. 
They're clear and comprehensible. And that very clarity is, of course, the problem. It fails to blind with archaism. Your learned friend, who is most likely your pompous friend, will seem markedly less learned, markedly less pompous, if it speaks the common tongue. The words and expressions remain hermetic. They do not advance beyond the state of jargon. They are, wittingly, spoken weapons of bafflement. They deliberately create incomprehension and bemusement. And it should be noted that legal Latin was once just Latin. It was co-opted by the law. It is not the law's coinage. There is a qualitative difference between Latinisms whose use is exclusively legal and those such as ad hoc, caveat emptor, post facto, sui generis, and so on. These latter have entered the English language as denizens, if you like, immigrants, if you don't like. They have crossed an invisible border from jargon into the vernacular. They're used by speakers and by writers like me who have forgotten most of the little Latin we once had and can recall only such things as Horace's marvelously graphic simile. Those who put off leading a full life are like this mouth-breathing Benny, who's going to wait till all the water has flowed by till he crosses. The river will flow and flow, he will wait and wait. This is a more expansive version of the same writer's Carpe Diem, another maxim which has crossed that border and shed the constraints of jargon. It should encourage us to epicureanism rather than opportunism. There is very little jargon, as opposed to slang, which describes, let alone celebrates, enjoyment and exhilaration. Very little jargon which accords with A.E. Hausmann's indisputable dictum that the pleasure of the moment is the only possible motive for action. Only a fool fluent in jargon or crippled by religious belief, would disagree. Immediate gratification is what makes life bearable, or the anticipation of immediate gratification, or anyway, uh, the possibility. In Hausmann's case, this would have meant a plentiful supply of guardsmen and gondoliers. Are you going to shave here or wait till you get back to barracks? No! Anyone who watches football will be familiar with the nutmeg. Lad A passes the ball through Lad B's legs. That's a nutmeg. If Lad A persists in nutmegging Lad B, he will be deemed to be lacking respect, a very important abstract concept in football as in life, and Lad B will elbow him in the eye. Whereupon Lad A will fall to the ground as though felled by a Tonton Makut hit squad, and Lad B will, when the panting former Gauleiter turned referee arrives on the scene, be sent off, or will see red, as they say. One thing that a nutmeg will gain you, as well as an elbow, is half a yard. This is a unit of measurement which is peculiar to football and to football's wise and articulate pundit philosophers. 
who week in, week out, employ it as though it were everyday speech, when in fact it is as arcane as such measurements as a peck, an ox gang, a livre, a mark, a penny weight, a London quarter. By the way, uh, Lad A has now recovered from his life-threatening injury. I suspect that these experts don't actually know what half a yard, 18 inches, looks like, how long it is. And they drone on about the back of the net. What about the front of the net? Half a yard, nutmeg, back of the net, sea red. Have entered the language to the extent that people who watch football on telly are apprised of what they signify. Yet they remain bound to their original locus, their original meaning. The sole exception derives from the philosopher footballer Joseph Barton, whose paradoxes are said to nutmeg one's mind. Otherwise, no use has been found for them outside football. They're well known, but exclusively in their original context. They are definitively jargon. So too are football's thefts from a blue-collar lexicon, which is now as extinct as the factories and mines which gave rise to it. He's got guys in there who are willing to put a shift in. He should put a, sh a shift in. They've got to mm. play those slide rule passes. Yeah. Just let him run all day. You say Arsenal not really at the races. You say we're at the races a day. Put a shift in, slide rule pass, not at the races. Does anyone under the age of 60 know what a slide rule is? Has anyone under the age of 60 ever missed a works outing bus to Haydock Park or Market Raisin? Jargon conditions behaviour. As we have seen, when a footballer brushes against another footballer, one or perhaps both will fall over. If this grave lack of balance were transferred to everyday life, then scenes such as this would be all too familiar. Footballers regularly increase the proportion of their body that is graffiti. They disfigure themselves with hideous tattoos, with brand marks. They may be Croesus brats, but they treat themselves like cattle. They have not read Leviticus. Nor do they know that the SS tattooed as an insult, as well as a means of identifying their victims. And as for free will, well, the poor sods have never heard of it. They're team players, so they follow the team, the mob. Team spirit isn't a virtue. It's merely falling in with the flock, obeying the common will. They alter their daft hairdos and their makeup weekly. So why can they not alter their accent? Their often incomprehensible regional accent. Accents are no more natural or inevitable than daft hairdos. It's not as if the lads have regional tattoos or regional daft hairdos. I tell you, woman, I be sick of we clack. Suppose now most everybody deny love party. You go about me, you wish to boat to play cricket. Why should regional jargon, regional dialect, regional accents be regarded as so admirable if they are incomprehensible to those with a different regional accent, a different regional jargon, a different collective lexicon? They often are incomprehensible. You can see how the pig population is going down. Yeah, you should have another 300 there at least. You yeah. can make it compare yeah. with them. He, yeah, but it's Alice Grand. But I'm dazzled with the mysteries of living. There was, and still exists, a wrong idea that mass media have caused regional accents to disappear. Television is supposed to have killed them off. It's an idea without foundation. Why, we call them causes down yonder, but oh. up here they call them buyers. Do they? Good. Uh -huh.
Well, that's a very fine mare, isn't it? She's a grand one. Yeah, it is indeed. In fact, both telly and radio display a wide range of regional accents, regional dialects, regional jargon, but perhaps not quite wide enough. West Country and Black Country accents, both stupidly regarded as signs of stupidity, are in short supply, whilst there is an overabundance of mid-Atlantic, generic northern, estuarial and Irish. I deeply care in hypersensitive big hard blades when I see a tiny child without limbs bleeding almost as much as my deeply care in hypersensitive big hard blades. Speech has changed. I don't mean usage, vocabulary and so on. That is, and always has been, always will be, in perpetual mutation. I mean the very purpose of speech. It is no longer exclusively a means of communication. It is increasingly employed as a self-conscious badge of identity. That is, of separateness, of difference. Mancunian usage is not that of the Lancashire towns. Tyne and Tees do not elide, nor Cardiff and Swansea. It's a badge of pride in your particularity, in where you come from. Where you come from, not me. All faiths, all moral codes, are instruments of repression. Accents are too. Dumping them frees us to go who knows where on an adventure. After I heard a tape recording of myself at the age of 17, I struggled to lose my South Wiltshire, West Hampshire burr. I had no desire to be bound by what came out of my mouth to a particular place. I did not want to be instantly classifiable. Nonetheless, I was horrified in my first week at RADA when a voice teacher, the late Michael McCallion, listened to a group of us read the same text and then told us where we came from. He got me bang to rights. Somewhere near Southampton, he said. Spot on. I grew up only 20 miles from that city, which is where all of my mother's family lived and which I visited every couple of weeks throughout my childhood. Michael's correct call was shaming. It made me strive even more to erase this banner of belonging. Shedding an accent is part of the process of self-obliteration, which necessarily precedes self-creation. It's a manacle which binds you to wherever you came from, to whatever faith or moral code you were brainwashed into. Dumping them frees us to go who knows where on an adventure. Scotland has a population of 5.2 million people. Just over 1% of them 55,000 speak Gaelic. And of that 55,000, 65,000 work for the BBC. <laughs> which funds the Gaelic channel Alba with actual money. Alba is comprehensible only to that 1%, all of whom speak English. There are no monoglot Gaelic speakers. Thus huge sums are frittered away on life support for a language which is a luxury, not a means of communication, but a symbol of tribal belonging. You have only to go back a mere seven centuries to a time when Gaelic was spoken in Lothian and the borders. Authenticity will link you to the distant past of your ancestors, that idyll of freezing mud, untreated animal furs, plague and woad. It was assumed that the advent of mass media would obliterate the particularities of topographically determined jargon. Newport Shropshire, Newport Monmouthshire, Newport Isle of Wight, Newport Pembrokeshire would become orally indistinguishable parts of the same community community. Homogeneity would prevail. They would, as team spirit mentorship advisors advise the easily advised, all sing from the same hymn sheet, a sheet soiled by overuse, lack of originality and maps of Ireland. At the third stroke, the time will be six o'clock and 20 seconds. At the third stroke, 
the time will be 6 o'clock precisely. At the third stroke, the time will be 6 o'clock and 10 seconds. Homogeneity didn't prevail. Regional accents, along with regional everything else, have been revived or have revived themselves. If anyone is acting daft, I say, why gone Kobe? These accents are worn with such pride, such misplaced pride, in their differences and their tics and their whimsical peculiarities that they have become foreign to one another. What are you like? Shut up, I'm on a computer, all right? But Babel is inimical to social mobility, to mobility full stop. It signals a fractured society composed of countless exclusive communities which, whilst they may not be actively antipathetical to each other, are certainly separate. This is willing apartheid, apartheid with a sugar coating, apartheid disguised as vibrant diversity, but apartheid nonetheless. <laughs> Television from the studios of Alexander Perry. Received pronunciation, RP, was the linguistic monoculture which has disappeared. It was practical. It enabled a pyromaniac from Elgin to understand an assurance assessor from Port Talbot, a palliative nurse from Norwich, a chemist from Wrexham, and an undertaker from Whitehaven were mutually comprehensible. The widely held wrong idea about received pronunciation is that it was a means by which people traitoriously slough their natural identity, whatever that is. What is germane here is that RP was a successful lingua franca, an auxiliary language. RP owes its iffy reputation, don't say iffy, say questionable, to its cinema and broadcast versions, which were aberrational. Since the opening of the television service in November 1936, the programmes transmitted have covered a wide range of entertainment and interest. Where on earth was it received from? The rank charm school? The douce Edinburgh suburb of Morningside? It did RP a disservice. It became an ingrown affectation as much as an accent. It was a tribal badge, like any regional accent. This was the tribe of the prissy and the bloodless. It had its own jargon, which was anything but earthy. But there was another form of RP which was simply functional. It merely meant suppressing accentual tics and quirks of usage. So a pan-British kind of comprehension was achieved. J.B. Priestley's celebrated wartime talks were obviously those of a Yorkshireman, but a Yorkshireman who could be understood in Yeovil. Could I speak to Mr. Oldenride, please? Oldenride. Oldenride. He could have spoken Yorkshire words, Mardy, Gradley, which would have seemed ridiculous if spoken by a southerner, but which were nonetheless comprehensible to a southerner. Jargon and dialect and accent are inseparable. I remember writing a book that became undeservedly popular. They made a film out of it called A Clockwork Orange. The great peripatetic Mancunian novelist Anthony Burgess and the great Aberdonian footballer Dennis Law, a long-time resident of Manchester, sound similar. So as we were walking along, I mean, absolute silence, he walked right by me. <laughs> <laughs> if you were injured, you were, you were out of the picture at all. RP was not a disguise. It was an instrument of social mobility a social mobility which no longer exists. Ingerland, land, 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 and a helpful veteran of Stalingrad won the World Cup in 1966. By then, RP was on its way out. This country's only successful national football manager, Sir Alf Ramsey, was consequently mocked for having overdone his elocution lessons. I think when selecting teams, selecting players, then, uh, then it becomes a little more lonely, in as much that one feels this very heavy burden. So what? His RP was recognisably that of the sergeant's mess, the workers' educational authority, the saloon bar. He spoke clearly, clearly enough 
for Argentinian footballers to get his gist when he called them henimals and so caused an international incident. We have still to produce our best, and this best is not possible until we, we uh, meet the right type of opposition. That is a team that comes out to, uh, out to play football and not act as animals. Genteel jargon poses a problem. If you cannot call a spade a spade, what can you call it? Speech-impaired onanist really doesn't cut it the way that dumb wanker does. And no one ever called a linesman, sorry, an assistant referee, a coupling labia. No genteel speaker would ever observe, let alone articulate, that when a darting run down the channel ends up with the ball in the back of the net, never the front, the scorer's subsequent celebrations a proxy masturbation. Or is that a load of testicles, a bowl of bovine evacuation? Genteel pretensions affect perception. The genteel shut out that which does not accord with their straightened worldview. They see what they believe in. We should believe in what we see. The scum, the sublime, the banal, the numinous, the dreary, the Elysian, and the operation waste seeping from a sack outside a clinic's back door. How boring the genteel life must be, a life that denies so much of life, a life led in fear of life. Inhibited language promotes inhibited behavior and vice versa. Is it the genitals themselves that cause offense? Or is it the many pleasurable uses they're put to? Or is it the vulgar names that are attached to them? It's liable to remain a mystery. Genteel persons are unlikely to respond to even the most courteous inquiries about the fastidious pathology they suffer. Tabloid newspapers are written by people who can't write and read by people who can't read. A character in Tom Stoppard's Night and Day observes, people think that rubbish journalism is produced by men of discrimination who are vaguely ashamed of truttling to the lowest taste. But it's not. It's produced by people doing their best work. What can their worst be like? Tabloid Ingerland Landlandish attempts to achieve urgency with a mendacious mix of naive exaggeration euphemism, elliptical constructions, and arcane words chosen for their punchiness. Trash journalism is another jargon which is widely comprehensible, but whose usage does not extend beyond the page and the screen. What is remarkable about its impoverished, cliched lexicon is that it would rarely be spoken by either its writers or its readers. Every match in every sport is a clash. No one talks of going to a clash at St. Mary's or Stamford Bridge, at the football ground, not the battle. Uh, no one boasts of their champagne lifestyle. No one quips about their Harridan mother-in-law. No one bemoans the fate of tragic toddler Dorina. No one owns up to having penned a script. No one witnesses a blaze. No one actually says vivacious strawberry blonde Tina. Bid, meaning hope to or try, is not used in speech. Celebrity Crossing Patrol Executive Howard Clent, 38, of Briarley Hill, Staffordshire, is bidding to be hailed Mr West Midlands Curry Inferno Waller for the third year in succession. Last year, Courageous Howard won the Etoff Clash with Sparkbrook's Norman Bullwinkle, downing no less than 14 mega fouls despite rupturing his duodenum in the semi-final. Quips Howard, overcoming the pain barrier is worth it if that's what it takes to become a legend. That way round, it's never Howard quips. 
Every blowjob is described as a disgusting sex act, a DSA. A startling euphemism, given the lack of disgust shown by tabloid treetop commandos with long lenses pointed at minor celebrities enjoying this form of Vatican-approved contraception. Just how disgusting can it be? But we should not forget that tabloid world's prurience levels are dangerously high and its moral compass void. Its hypocrisy is astounding, or would be were we not so inured to it and to its grubby schoolboy lexicon of wardrobe malfunctions, side boobs, and flaunting, 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 flaunting. This is the language of the verbally inert, the language employed in the tabloid coarsening of just about everything. It adds up to a codified pact between xenophobic morons. Xenophobic morons who sort of write and xenophobic morons who sort of read. The average gutter press reader is a slow reader. It takes all day to read the paper and to have its prejudices confirmed. That coarsening is not, of course, restricted to the gutter press. Television is equally infected. What can one say about this great and gruesome city that hasn't been said a thousand times before? This was where I lived for years, and I imagine accepted for years. This is the first of four programs in which I want to question some of the assumptions usually made about the tradition of European painting. People are beginning to take advantage of an astonishing new liberty. We can actually talk about things and people with the same freedom that you can in magazines and books. All that power and certainty and ambition and cruelty... The language the used by such writers as James Cameron, John Berger and Kenneth Tynan, supple, articulate, confident of its audience's comprehension, has disappeared to be replaced by the grunts of primates. Television's abject distractions are found in humiliation and bullying. Freak shows fronted by scum of the earth barrow boys and freelance bivs are neither intellectually nor morally justifiable. They appeal to the lowest instincts. You cannot marriage, multi-platform kerosene with culture culture. But no one ever magneto feathered by double axling. Expand to contract, contract to expand. Vibrantly diverse world-class content. Aerosols, right brain aerosols. Front loading, underlay bleed partnerships. Have they rarely got poverty lust? Or is it seahorse quainting? We need Big dick thinking. Big dick. Otherwise, we're retrofitting. Thank you. <laughs> Jargon's ubiquity is a measure of the extent to which we are being lied to and conned all the time. Language and usage are gauges both of gullibility and authority, patient and agent, the controlled and the dominant, the meek and the trump. Discrimination is vital in what is called the arts sector, which has little to do with art and everything to do with following exhausted fashions. The ability to distinguish between noisome rubbish and noisome rubbish which purports to be art is a demanding and arcane task. It is not vouchsafed to anyone without a doctorate in paradigmatic waste interventionism. Nonetheless, even these experts make mistakes. A highly qualified gallery cleansing operative might, in an access of sanity, fail to recognise that a used condom, a pizza with some cigarette butts in it and a few beer cans comprise a major work and sweep it away. He or she could be chucking out a work worth millions. But not to worry. When such a fate befell some art rubbish by Gustav Metzger at the Tate, sorry, Tate, full stop, it's lost the V to make it, well, younger, buzzier, more intensely, serotonally relevant. 
It was pointed out by a spokesmoron that the artist had not actually had to go to the trouble of picking up new rubbish to create a replacement work of art, but had simply found a bag that had already been filled and discarded. According to the spokesmoron, who was presumably acting on the orders of a senior moron, the bags are taken from where they are found and placed in the gallery space. He doesn't manipulate what's in the bag. Now, that's good to know. Anthony Burgess wrote, Art is dangerous. When it ceases to be dangerous, you don't want it. Installations and found objects ceased to be dangerous decades ago. It's a century since Marcel Duchamp changed the face of urinals forever. Bad joke then, and one which has only got worse with constant retelling. Here are some of the properties invariably ascribed to installations. You can simply tick them off. Provocative, challenging, subversive, ahead of its time, controversial, groundbreaking, radical, cutting edge, empowering, and yes, dangerous. Really? They're about as dangerous as a soft toy. It's a very expensive soft toy, of course. They're about as subversive as a high-end BMW, about as challenging as a poached egg. And they sell for millions. Installations, especially minimalist installations, are the supreme trophies of the international establishment. That super haute bourgeoisie, which is rich enough, gormless enough, and boastful enough to own foundations, exhibition spaces, parks, and galleries. Places where the rubbish can be displayed. Site-specific rubbish and mute rubbish, for installations have absolutely nothing to say. They might have been sworn to silence. The Trappist dictum, be in this world, not of it, is the very worst precept that any artist can follow. Yet we live in Trappist art's golden age. In this debased milieu, anything is art if an artist says it is art. This is rather akin to Tony Blair's conviction or delusion that a course of action is correct because it is his course of action. Under the aegis of phenomenology, privileging experience and expression instead of a priori conceptualization and theoretical interpretation, Quite who anoints a half-wit as an artist is a different matter. The evocation of surveillance provokes the construction of a narrative and a questioning of the intentions of the foyer. But it's not important, because whilst we may acknowledge the half-wit's right to call itself an artist, we do not have to acknowledge that the art is anything other than worthless. Exploring notions of compromised narrativity and consequent hybridization in multicultural handshake sheds. The history of art since Duchamp has been the history of the kings and even the pawns within the art loop, patronizing those outside the art loop for their Ostrogothic philistinism in failing to appreciate drivel, mocking pretentious art criticism, and above all, excoriating the jargon of art. It's also the history of people too afraid and too peer pressured to admit that they know they're being flogged a pup. 
Mm, subtle appropriations of literary and cinematic reference, migrations of restricted discourse, philosophic, not forms, questions of culture and identity. There are no trades which are more contaminated by meaningless, self-congratulatory, obfuscating jargon than those of curator, patron, critic, gallery director, panjandrum. They speak only to each other or to themselves. They are often as not the same person in multiple roles. The art loop is forever out to shock. Pickled corpses, obviously. Performance artists severing bits of their bodies to eat. Insulting royals. Suicides by several means. Burning buildings. Shit, shit, and more shit. Drowning babies. Black pudding made from the artist's blood. Bestiality workshops. And genitals by the truckload. The usual stuff. And because it is so usual, so utterly familiar, it fails in its mission. It does not shock as it intends. Its commonplace triteness is not shocking at all. Questioning notions of questioning notions. Curating curation, curating curators. But it does shock in a way that it is incapable of realising, in a way that is not intended. Its carelessly ignorant mauling of the English language is truly shocking. The work of people with tin ears and such lack of originality that they resort to cliché. Sorota called his application to run the Tate, grasping the nettle. That very title should have disqualified him. But of course it didn't because the clique that chose him recognised him as one of their own, with the same gross insensitivity to English. It's for everyone. It is somehow... That insensitivity is shared by the curator's curator, Hans Ulrich Obrist, who mauls the language with insouciant abandon. The poor man is quite unaware that the words he expectorates are so meaningless that they might constitute a private idiolect that he alone can understand. Within this whole information explosion, curating is used more and more. We can see it on Amazon, uh, book lists are being curated. We can see it in magazines, um, pages are being curated, concept stores are being curated. Of course it is understood. It's a pigeon loosely based on English. A lingua franca, globally spoken by the few thousand people who inhabit the art loop and who foist their taste on the world. Cultish, exclusive, incomprehensible to the uninitiated, uncommunicative, which is the very opposite of art, entirely lacking in transparency. It is scared to say anything. Or is it art by people who want to be artists but have no skills whatsoever? It is unique, a lingua franca which is also a language of exclusion, a word fortress built by the inmates to keep out the mocking gawpers who want to visit the asylum to jeer at the inmates. A fortress that has evidently been breached. We shall go on mocking. You Listen to Word of Mouth on iPlayer Radio now, Radio 4's exploration of the world of words. Next tonight, man may have walked on the moon, but no one has journeyed to the bottom of the Amazon. Come with us into the abyss. Yeah.